Welcome back to a special Encore episode of Five Good Questions. I'm your host, Jake Taylor. Our guest today is Jillian Zoe Siegel. Jillian is an author and noted photographer who went to the University of Michigan and earned a law degree from the Benjamin Cardoza School of Law. Her new book, Getting There, is a collection of leaders in diverse fields sharing their secrets to navigating the rocky road to the top. Jillian interviewed some amazing people, including Warren Buffett, Michael Bloomberg, John Paul DeJoria, Anderson Cooper, Jillian Michaels, Laird Hamilton, and Hans Zimmer. She got to know some amazing people in writing this book. Let's ask her five good questions. Welcome back to the show, everybody. Guest today is Jillian Zoe Siegel, author of Getting There. Hey, Jillian, where are we chatting with you today? I'm in my apartment in New York. Nice. So uh, <clears throat> let's ask you some five good questions. Question number one. Uh, one of my most interesting takeaways from your book was how hard everyone that you profiled worked to get where they are. I, I was actually kind of surprised. I mean, I knew it took hard work to be successful, but holy cow, this is, in, this is on a whole nother level. There really appear to be no shortcuts. Can you give us a couple of your favorite examples of how hard uh, some of these what we we'll call overnight success stories, how hard they really worked. Yes. Uh, and, and just before I even get into that, part of the reason why I wrote this book is because there is a common misperception. When you look at someone who's a luminary in their field, it's just so easy to imagine that they sort of had a smooth, steady ascent to get to where they are. Um, but it's really not the case. And it's really inspirational to hear the truth behind all of these stories. Um, so the first, the first example is Michael Bloomberg. Um, he, you know, is one of the richest men in the world, and he founded Bloomberg LP, and he was mayor of New York City for three consecutive terms. Uh, but he got to where he was, where he is, because he got fired from his job at Solomon Brothers, and um, no one swooped in to give him another job, so he figured he would start his own company. Um, but he's pretty famous for saying, like, be the first one in and the last one out. And he really gave working hard a new meaning. Like, he's not where he is uh, for any other reason except for that he worked super hard. And he was starting his company. He wanted feedback. So he used to go to the deli across from Merrill Lynch every morning at 6 o'clock, and he would get a coffee with milk and without milk and a tea with milk and without milk. And he would put them on a tray. And then he would go roam the halls of Merrill Lynch looking for someone who might be sitting alone uh, reading the paper. And he'd pop his head in the door and say, hey, I, I brought you coffee. Can I bend your ear? And um, that's the way that he got in with people that he wouldn't otherwise have access to and got you know, good feedback for his company. So that's one example. Oh, one more thing about him. When he got fired from Solomon Brothers, he still made sure to work six days a week from as early in the morning until as late as he could. Why? Because he just didn't want anyone to ever say that he didn't work 110%. And I think that that kind of mentality is what got him where he is and what got him elected mayor of New York City three times in a row. Because we all know that he'd work you know, as hard as he possibly could to do the best job he possibly could. That's great. Um, I mean, he had a he had a brand that really of himself that he was protecting and and making mm -hmm. sure that that it was uh you know his reputation preceded him. Yes, definitely. Um, okay, Gary Hirschberg. He founded Stonyfield Farms. Uh, that's the organic yogurt company, and it took Stonyfield nine years to make its first nickel. Nine years of Gary. <laughs> You know, talking about the importance of organic food when no one even knew what organic food was, and they thought it probably meant that there was dirt in the food or something. Um, but he really, you know, he he believed in what he was doing, and now the rest of us do as well. Um, the other one is Kathy Ireland. She runs. Um, she well, she became famous originally for being a Sports Illustrated swimsuit model. How could I forget? Yes. <laughs> Everyone of a certain age knows yeah. that. Um, but, but she now runs a $2 billion a year business, and she has her name on over 15,000 products. Uh, she's bigger than Martha Stewart. So 
a lot of people look at her and they think, okay, well, if I was born looking like that, I could slap my name on some products and make a killing too. But that is so not the case. She um, failed for years at trying to start her own brand. She, she tried starting with um, a beer company, a line of skincare, several arts and crafts projects. And eventually she was able to, la to launch her company with a line of socks, of all things. And um, why a line of socks? Well, someone offered her the big opportunity to model socks, which, <laughs> as you can imagine, she wasn't too thrilled with. Yeah, it's not very flattering. <laughs> yes, for, for an aging model, you know. So she, um, so she said, you know what, I'll only model them if I could partner with you. And that's how she started her brand. But even once it started, it wasn't easy. She slept in airports to save money. They almost went bankrupt. Anyway. Those are a few stories. Yeah, that's incredible. So I uh, could go on and on and on, but I won't. Yeah. So question number two: What was some of the, the your favorite stories of risk taking in the from your from the book? Um, all right. Well, one of the people who laid who laid the um, this out in a really easy to understand way was Jim Cook, who um, is the founder of the Boston Beer Company. They make Sam Adams beer. Um, and basically, he graduated from Harvard, uh, and he got a job at the Boston Consulting Group, and that was a really cushy job that a lot of people were jealous of, and it appeared he was doing great. But he was really miserable with what he was doing, and he had this dream of starting his own company, and, um, but he was afraid of risking it all to, to, you know, to go off and do this, until the day that he realized that the real risk was not taking a risk uh, because if he didn't take a risk, he would just be stuck in a job that he didn't like for the rest of his life. And if he did take a risk and it didn't pan out, he could always just rejoin the workforce and find another job he didn't like. So he, yeah. uh, he, really, laid, he really laid it out there. So that wasn't, that wasn't like the hugest risk he took, but to him it seemed like it at the time. Um, other people, okay, there is a scientist in my book called J. Craig Venter. Um, he was one of my favorite people to meet. He was the first person to sequence the human genome. And what that means, because it might sound complicated, it sort of sounded complicated to me. Not sort of, it did sound complicated <laughs> <laughs> to me before, before I researched it. Basically, when you sequence a genome, you're just reading the human gene to see what it has to say. And that's why now um, you could say, I have the gene for this cancer or that cancer. And there's a lot of medical possibilities that knowing how to do that has provided us with. Um, anyway, he had a job with the government, and they were trying to sequence the genome. And he thought he had a better method. But as hard as he tried, he couldn't get the government to change their ways. So he left his job, and he started his own company, raised a lot of money, and he did it in a super quick time. Um, but so uh, meanwhile, everybody, all of his colleagues, not everybody, most of, the col of his colleagues were um, criticizing him, saying this will never work, and you know, it's a waste of time and a waste of money and all of that. And now all of those critics are using his method to, to do their research. Um, but something he said that was interesting is he had been in Vietnam um, and he had a really terrible time in Vietnam as most people did. Um, and after risking his life day in, day out and seeing his own age die every day, for him taking a career risk didn't seem like such a big deal. So he figured, you know what, I'm in America. I'm not going to die. What is the big deal for me, you know, risk, risking my career? Um, yeah, it all seems small at that point. Yes, yes, exactly. And, and someone else in my book who's um, a performance artist named Marina Abramovic, she's, she suggests that you think of death daily to keep things in perspective. And I have heard of other people who read the obituaries for that purpose. But, you know, if you're so scared of something, if you think about it, you know, I'm going to die one day, and this really is not such a big deal. It just puts things in perspective. 
Yeah. I could go on. <laughs> or... <laughs> no, that's a great uh, segue okay. actually for, for question number three. And one of my other key takeaways about from the book uh, was that all these people were, were singularly obsessed with some particular mission they were trying to accomplish. And the, each of them had their own why for what was driving them. But n- now that many of them seem to have, have accomplished and, you know, made it by most people's standards, um, the fact that they're, you know, famous, I wanted to ask you, interacting with them, did they seem like they're happy? You know, did they find that pot of gold at the end of their own personal rainbow? Um, well, here, here's the thing. Happiness, uh, you know, in order to be happy, you need to be, you, ha- you need to have a lot of different departments all working together. So you could be happy in your career, but your child is having a problem, and then you're not a happy person. It could have nothing to do with your career. So um, I, think, I think that in their careers, everybody in my book is thrilled. Whether there's something else going on that has nothing to do with, you know, with anything, I don't, I don't know. But, um, but they're all really thrilled. And that's one of the huge themes of my book is that um, you have to do something that you're passionate about. Because like we were discussing, nothing is easy. And um, if you're not in love with what you're doing, you, you might do an okay job. But you're not going to get to the top. Because in order to do that, you have to jump a lot of hurdles. And if you don't like what you're doing, you're not going to have the fuel to do that. Um, and another thing is that um, a guy in my book, Laird Hamilton, who is a famous surfer, he talks about uh, the importance of always changing your goal once you reach it. And I think a lot of the people in my book do this. Um, they might have reached a goal by other people's standards, but they're always working towards something. And, you know, it's not like they're all sitting in bed eating bonbons and <laughs> saying, I Celebrating made it. their success. <laughs> yeah, they're on, to, they're on to the next thing. Um, and basically, you know, it, they're always working towards something. Yeah, that's, that's huge, I think. And, and I think, too, that helps with the, with the happiness requires progress, right? If you don't feel like you're making progress in life, it's probably hard to, to feel happy. So changing yes. your goal can can help, you know, keep, keep that carrot out in front of you. Exactly. Exactly. So here's a question that I think everybody wants to know. I mean, you had, you interviewed Warren Buffett, Michael Bloomberg, uh, John Paul DeJoria, Anderson Cooper, Laird Hamilton, Jillian Michaels, Hans Zimmer. I mean, just this incredible list of people. First of all, how the heck did you get them? Mm-hmm. Second of all, how did you get them to to open up like they did, and what what was the process that you used for for get, for doing that and for uh, having them write their own pieces, uh, fitting into your narrative, really? Well, you, I'll tell you that in a minute. But they didn't write their own pieces, so I'll tell okay. you. Um, so basically, the hardest part of doing this book was getting the subjects, and um, and I got ignored by everybody at first and then when they were done ignoring me they rejected me yeah. and then I kind of you know would would try again from another angle so a friend of mine pretty early in the process said to said something to me that stuck with me he said don't take a no from somebody who can't give you a yes and basically what that means is these everybody in my book is super busy and they delegate responsibility so I might have had to go through somebody's assistant or publicist or whatever now if one of those people tell you no you listen sort of but then you try to ask somebody else because you don't know whether the decision maker whether you know in my case the subject ever even knew I was asking right it could have been stopped early so basically what I've told people is Try the front door. If that's locked, try the back door. If that's locked, try the side door. If that doesn't work, climb in the window. Like, just <laughs> keep, keep at it um, until you get noticed. Once you really know that the decision maker has seen your request and said no, then, you know, lose graciously. <laughs> yeah. You don't want to be annoying. What do you think, but, um, what do you think your uh, batting average was as far as asks to eventual... Uh, you know, success. Uh, it's hard to say. I, I don't know. You know, maybe like 
It could have been. It depended on the the um, the field. You know, certain fields were tougher sure. than others. So uh, I don't know if it was ten to one or you know, but it's but it was hard. It was hard. So that's so your own story of of getting there and perseverance. Exactly. Yeah. It, there's a getting there, getting there story, um, and. Yeah, polite persistence is the name of the game. And and if I had to say that there was one characteristic that everybody in my book had, it's that. It's resilience and persistence. They all got knocked down and rejected and had, you know, different tragedies happen to them in their lives. Uh, but but all of these people are are in my book because they stood back up and they tried again. And if you try enough times, something will probably work out for you. Um, so okay, what did I do when I finally met these people? Um, I interviewed them and had a whole conversation with them. I asked them lots of questions. Some of the questions I asked everybody. Some of the questions were tailored just just for the individual subject. Um, and at the end of it, I had my interview transcribed. It would probably be around 20 pages. And then I edited it down to the essays that you see in the book, which are about five or six pages long. Yeah, um, very digestible. And, I really liked that part of the book. It was it was like you could just grab a chapter one off and read it and, and hear the interesting story of how someone made it. Um, yeah, thank you, because I have a short attention span, so <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was geared towards people who might not read a whole book. <laughs> um, anyway, but, but um, so, so basically, when I was done making the essay, I would send it back to the subject. And before I even talked to them, I would tell them that that's how it was going to go. I said, you know, just be as open as you can. Um, and when I'm done, I'm going to send this back to you and you can cut anything, you know. I, it, it wasn't like I was out to get anybody. I was out to celebrate what they had to offer. Mm -hmm. And I wanted everybody in the book to be happy with how they came across. So that's how. So basically, they talked about everything. And very, very, very few of them wanted to change anything when I sent it back to them. Well, I nice. tried to yeah. sort of... Yeah, to keep their own their voice and their words, and you know, as so it it was a pretty easy process. Well, just based on uh, understanding now, the conversation turning into uh, what really sounded more like they wrote their own little mini, uh, you know, autobiography. I, I commend you on that that process. That was pretty impressive. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I'm, it su was a, I'm surprised it was, that that's how it worked. <laughs> just in case anyone thinks it's easy, because I thought before I started this, I thought that it would be easy because I didn't have to write and it'll be in their own words and I just had to move things around. I, I spent a good week in my pajamas writing each essay, like not leaving the house, you know, like waking up, sliding my computer onto my bed, <laughs> writing, you know. So it, it was a lot more time-consuming uh, than I thought it would be. Yeah, no, I don't doubt that. <clears throat> so question number five, and this one gets a little bit more personal for you. Um, after interacting with all of these amazing people, hearing all their stories, is there anything that you're going to stop doing now uh, because of what you've learned on this multi-year journey of, of writing this book? Um, okay, here, this is something I, I really learned. Um, I, I think in my life there had been times where maybe I wanted to do something kind of career-wise and I would run it by some people and I would be stopped by a negative reaction. And that's something that this book has really taught me not to do because pretty much no matter what you do, if you said I'm going to invent Twitter, there would be people, if you said, you know, who are saying it's not a good idea, no one will do it. If you said I'm going to invent email, I would have said, why would you use email when you can use the phone? <laughs> like, yeah. you're going to have people. So you just have to watch out for that and sort of, um, you know. Guard your, uh, your idea. Guard your ideas. Yes, exactly. And there's two people in the book who really speak about this in a great way. One of them is Sarah Blakely. She invented Spanx, which is... Um, she's doing okay for herself. She's days. a billionaire, yes. <laughs> and um, 
Fangs is it's just shapewear. It's like, you know, footless panty clothes, control top and all that. Um, but basically, um, she kept her idea secret for a full year before she told anyone. And when she finally told people that her idea was footless pantyhose, they all laughed at her. And then when they were done laughing, they said things like, well, honey, you know, if it's a good idea, then why haven't the big guys done it? Or the big guys are going to just knock it off. And, you know, but she was, she had kept it secret for a year. So she was already so invested in it that she didn't let this take her off course. Um, same thing with Frank Gehry, the architect. He he had a, a professor in in architecture school call him into the office and say, "Listen, you are not going to make it in this field. You better quit now and just save your energy." But he was too far along. He was too enamored with it and too far along to quit. So that's one thing. Watch out! Watch out for early detractors. Um, and someone else who talks about this is Jeff Kinney, who is the author of the Diary of a Wimpy Kid series. I've, and, read, um, I've read more than those than I care to admit. No, my my <laughs> oldest son loves those that series. Do you know that he actually originally wrote those for adults? He had an adult audience in mind. So they were written for you. But <laughs> but then They're actually then, pretty funny. So I mean it's They are. Yeah. They are, they're funny. Um well he spent eight years writing his diary his first diary of a wimpy kid book. And he kept his idea secret from most people because it, he, he spent so long because he thought, you know, this is my big idea and I want to get it right. And if he had told a lot of people about it, he'd feel some social pressure to do what he said he would do in a year or to make it the way he made it. And when you're working on something big, you need... You need the flexibility to change directions when need be or take more time. And sometimes that's just a lot easier if you keep it to yourself. Yeah, I could see that. So one uh, question, bonus question we always ask everybody, and that's for a, a book recommendation. So what, what do you have for us today? Okay. Well, there's two books um, that I recommend a lot. They have nothing to do with business, but they're... That's fine, they're... yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. One of them is called The Glass Castle by Jeanette Walls. And um, it's just, it's a memoir and you won't believe it. Just go buy it. <laughs> she, <laughs> she grew up, she grew up um, in such a impoverished and dysfunctional family and she made so much of herself that it's just really inspiring. Um, and it puts things in perspective. You know, if you're going through something, you think, all right, well, she she made this of herself. And um, What's my excuse? <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, another one I just thought was really interesting is called Kitchen Confidential. Yeah. Um, actually, oh, I have this one here. I don't have the glass castle right here because I gave that one away. But anyway, this this book, we all go to restaurants. And this gives such an incredible insight into what it takes to run these businesses that we go into, you know, all the time. Um, and it also teaches you what to order and where, <laughs> when, when to watch out for the fish being yeah. rotten, basically. Right. It's a great book. Well, Jillian, we really appreciate you having, coming on the show today. We had a lot of fun Thank talking you. with you. Thank you so much for having me. All right. Take care. Bye-bye.